In a few moments, we're going to open our Bibles uh, and read from Revelation chapter 2. So you're certainly more than welcome to turn there now. But uh, I found it appropriate uh, by way of uh, uh, beginning today's message to share with you all a little bit uh, about something personal because I thought it sort of applied here this morning as I reflected upon the message that God laid on my heart. Just want to uh, make mention uh, that, that I was blessed this week to uh, celebrate uh, my 32nd anniversary with my uh, lovely bride. Um, and we celebrated by going out to Red Lobster, and I had lots of shrimp, and it was really good. Um, fact of the matter is, when, when, when our anniversary comes around, we don't exchange gifts anymore because we really don't, don't need a lot, but we do exchange cards still. Cards are kind of a big deal. And, and so as I get my card every year, I try to, try to really think about what I can write down in that card that will somehow represent how I really feel about my wife. And so I'm, I'm, this, this is sort of personal, but I'm going to share with you what I wrote, wrote this year. Here, here's what I wrote. I, I, I said, just when I think I can't love you anymore, the sun rises and I wake up next to you. While the new day is full of challenges, it is also filled with endless possibilities because I get to spend it with you. Always and forever love, Tom. And I share that with you not because I want you to be impressed or think that somehow that is worthy of a Hallmark card. Uh, the fact of the matter is I am sure there are many of you men who have written things much more poetic and profound and powerful to your wives over the years. The fact of the matter is I wanted to share it this morning because it reflects how I feel about my wife after 32 years of marriage. And the fact of the matter is we've had some... some some difficult times along the way. We've had some really challenges. There were times early in our marriage that I was not certain that we would, our marriage could survive, that we would stay together. But the fact of the matter is, as I've said, I, I feel closer to her and I love her more today than I have at any other point in my life. And I try to write it in a card, but I try to do more than that. I try to live it out in my life. I try to show her all the time. I don't always get it right. I mess up lots of times. There are many instances where I lose sight of what is really important. There are many instances where I begin to take her love for granted. And the reality of it is, is that can happen to anybody. Any relationship. At any time. It can even happen in our relationship with God. And so, in the aftermath of what has been a wonderful Easter season, where we have taken time to reflect upon God's love for us. We have taken time to reflect upon His willingness to even die for us, loving us that much. We came together two weeks ago, and we worshipped, and we praised His name, and we told Him how much we loved Him. But if we are not careful, time can go by, and we can begin to take Him for granted. And it can happen more easily than you think. And today's scripture, I will share with you how it not only can happen to an individual, but it can happen to an entire church. Listen now to the words of Revelation chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and, are not, and, and, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, and unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of, of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, 
which is in the paradise of God. May the Lord have his blessing in his reading and hearing of his holy word. I reflect upon these words, which are the words of Jesus himself. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is speaking to John, who's putting it on paper for the churches, seven churches that are uh, addressed in the book of Revelation. These are the words of Jesus. And as I reflect upon his words, I acknowledge that there are times in our lives as couples, even Christian couples, where one of the partners might abandon might abandon the love they had for the other. It happens. And when it happens, it is not pretty. It is not biblical, but it is part of living in a fallen world. And it happens in about 50% of marriages, and they end in divorce. But the question I would ask you today is, who abandons God? Who abandons God? Who forgets what God has done for them? Who steps away from that first love? That first love that you had for your Savior? Well, obviously a church in Ephesus did just that 2,000 years ago, and Jesus is directing it. It happens. It happens. It happens to individuals. It happens to churches. And we see it in our text today. A church that was working hard it was working hard, still working hard, Jesus says. It was a church that had great zeal for God. It sought discernment of God. It is a church that had nothing to do with false teachers, Jesus says. Nothing to do. It was willing to stand up for what was right, to take a stand against evil. Probably had good leadership, this church in Ephesus. And Jesus is talking about all these things and commending them for all of this. Then he comes to verse number 4. Having said all these wonderful things, all of a sudden his attitude changes dramatically. And he says, that's all fine and good, what you're doing. But I have this against you. You have left your first love. You have left your first love. Wonderful... Anglican priest John Stott who has since gone home to be with the Lord he describes the words of Jesus this way he says they had fallen from the early heights of devotion to Christ which they had climbed they had descended to the plains of mediocrity in a word they were backsliders Stott says certainly the hearts of the Ephesians had been chilled that's how John Stott put it I mean, and how haunting are those words? I mean, think about it. How, what a horrible way to describe a Christian. Their heart had been chilled, he says. And he would go on to say that their first blush of ecstasy had passed. Their early devotion to Christ, it had cooled. They had been in love with Him, but they'd fallen out of love with Him. I mean, think about this for a moment. The Apostle Paul, in his closing words to the Ephesians, his letter to the Ephesians, he says this about the Ephesian church. He says, Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus with an incorruptible love. That's how he addresses this church. Just 30 years earlier, that's about the same amount of time I've been married to my wife. Jesus would proclaim, you've left that love, that first love you had that incorruptible love, you walked away from it, you abandoned it, is what Jesus is saying to that church. Yes, I'm not going to deny it, he might say. At one time, your devotion was sincere. You consistently were seeking me out. You worshipped me, and your worship was both meaningful and it was satisfying to you, but that's cooled off. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus says, I hold that against you. I hold that against you. In 30 plus years of marriage, my love for my wife continues to grow. In 30 years of following Jesus, that church of long ago, their love for Jesus had faded. Stott says of that church, he says their devotion had turned and was ebbing fast. They toiled with vigor. They did lots of work, but they did it without love. They endured with fortitude. But without love, they, they tested their teachers with orthodoxy, 
but they had no love in their hearts. Now I could ask you the question today. I could say, do you have the same feeling for Jesus that you had just two weeks ago when we celebrated Easter? For some of you, that might be a legitimate question to ask. But I want to take you a little further back. I want to take you back to that time where you first turned to Jesus, where you first believed in Him. I want you to think back to that time in your life when the weeks and months that followed, the feelings, the thoughts that you had where you could hardly contain yourself. Do you remember what that was like? Do you remember what that was like? You couldn't keep quiet about Jesus. Talked about Him to everyone. And every day you were in your Bible. I mean, you had to be. You needed more and more. You were soaking it in. You were like a sponge. Couldn't get enough. Your love and, and your devotion. It was obvious to everybody who saw you. Because it was consistent. It was transparent. It was incorruptible. Sounds a lot like the Ephesians. There were no secrets. There were no hidden agendas. It was just love and commitment to my Savior. It was the start of what we might call an intimate relationship. Because relational intimacy is defined as a warm and satisfying friendship developing through long association on a very personal and private level. You started down that road feeling so close and so excited about Jesus. And it was leading down the road to an intimate relationship. The way most intimate relationships start, right? I think about uh, my, my relationship with my wife. 32 years of marriage. And, and we met working together. And it got off to a bit of a rocky start, I acknowledge. She almost killed me in the car as she was driving uh, us to a meeting. And we got there, and the person who was uh, training us said, you know, you might, you might meet your wife here at Zales Jewelers. We were working together at Zales. He said, you might. A lot of people do. He said, a lot of managers meet their wife right here on the job. And he said, you might marry Denise. And I said, no, <laughs> that'll never happen. He said, maybe, maybe Kathy Benzak. She was the blonde who was there. I said, but not Denise. <laughs> That's a true story. But here's the thing. We drew closer and closer, and 32 years later, I cannot imagine my life without her. That's the way intimate relationships start and continue to grow. Now we are asked to compare our initial meeting with Jesus and the time that followed <coughs> with the time that we spend with Him today, with our walk with Jesus today. And I would challenge you to examine that. Because it oftentimes changes dramatically. And sometimes for the better, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here. Some of you feel closer today than you ever have before. But sometimes it changes, not for the better, but for the worse. Some sadly can relate to those words of Jesus. Some of us, you know, we need to heed the command of Jesus. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds that you did at first. Some of us have to step back and say, I need to, to have that same longing to be in the presence of God. We talked about this yesterday at a men's prayer breakfast. The psalmist in Psalm 84 who says, my heart longs to be in the presence of God to the point of making me faint. I want to be with Him so much. We need to look back and start begin to do the things that we were doing when we first came to a saving relationship with our Savior Jesus Christ. That love that, that I have for my life 32 years after I said I do has grown. And I am so grateful for God, for my wife, and, and for that. But, 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 but here's the thing. No love for anybody ever grows without both work and commitment. That's just the reality. Anybody who has a successful marriage here and says that they didn't have to make significant commitments and they had to work at it, well, I challenge you to, uh, to, uh, to allow me to sit down and talk to you a little bit about that. It involves commitment. It involves work. Any relationship that is successful, that has real love, that grows, involves that. The love, the intimacy that you had with God in the beginning if that's what you're after, you've got to work at it. You really do. You've got to be committed. You've got to be intentional about it. 
I mean, let's be honest. The world's vying for our attention at every corner. It is vying for our attention. It is shouting us out to us. It is saying, you need to do this. You need to go there. You need to buy me, watch us, enjoy life, drink up, early bird, working lunches, happy hour, after hours, can't miss, once in a lifetime, no one has to know, and on and on it goes. That's what the world is crying out to us, and it's doing it at a very, very fast pace. We're almost going through it at warp speed. We've got to, we want to have this relationship with God, this intimacy with God. We've got to really want it. You've got to really want it. You've got to be committed to it. And you have to discipline yourself. Because if you don't discipline yourself, it's probably not going to happen. I think of the words uh, that Paul writes to Timothy. Uh, in chapter 4 of uh, his first letter to Timothy. Let me share with you this. Uh, it's from the, the message, I believe, uh, is what I printed this up. And let me share it. It says, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished on the truths of the faith and of good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life that comes. In these words, Paul is writing to Timothy, who happens to be serving in the church in Ephesus. It takes place, these words to Timothy, in between. In between the words that Paul shares with the Ephesians and his letter to them, and the, the words that Jesus shares in his letter to the Ephesians in Revelation. Paul is saying, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. He is saying, it's time for you to get serious about your walk. That's what he's saying to, to Timothy and to the church in Ephesus, because frankly, godliness does not happen by accident. Going to church and being religious, that's not the end all here. It's not the end all. You see, to get religious is somewhat easy. To be intimate with God that takes work. It takes commitment. It takes discipline. You see, without discipline, you and I, we become stagnant. We begin to cool off. We begin to maybe even lose our first love. You see, discipline might be defined as training that corrects and perfects our mental faculties or molds our moral character. It is necessary if we are to grow. It is necessary. Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse number 10, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. Becoming like Him in His death. The Amplified Bible translates it this way, for my determined purpose is that I may know Him that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of His person more strongly and more clearly. It says, my determined purpose, my discipline, He is saying, is that I might achieve my goal. And my goal is knowing God more intimately and more personally. So I ask you the question, is that your goal? Is it really your goal to know God more intimately? More personally? Because I can assure you this morning, that's His desire. That's absolutely what He wants from you. Not only you get to back to where you loved Him in the first place when you first believed, 
But he wants you to build upon that, that that love would grow more and more deeper and deeper day after day, so that in 32 years from now, you can say, Jesus, I, I love you more today than I ever have before. If that's your goal, I'm here to tell you the only way it happens is by discipline. It only happens by discipline. The first step this morning is to say, that's my goal. I mean, it really is. I mean, you've got you to want that as your goal. You've got to say, Jesus, my goal is to know you more intimately and more personally. You know, so I ask the question, is that your goal? Is that your goal? If that's your goal, why don't you repeat after me? My goal is to know Jesus more intimately and more personally. Now go ahead and repeat that. My goal is to know Jesus more intimately and more personally. That's step one. You've got to really want that. You've got to desire it. That has to be your goal. The second step involves commitment. Are you committed to truly working at it? To being disciplined at it? Because that's always the second step, saying, God, I am committed to this. This is my goal, and I'm committed to it. Over the next, I mean, because the discipline, the discipline is what enables us to achieve the goal. It is. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at some different spiritual disciplines. Over the next several weeks, we're going to look at what I believe are, are disciplines that can make a difference in our walk with Jesus. That is, uh, uh, if you're really committed. If you're really committed. We're going to look at the discipline, and I love this, John, because you spoke of this. Next week, we're going to look at the discipline of simplicity. We're going to look at the discipline of simplicity. And we're going to look at the discipline of silence and solitude. We're going to look at the discipline of surrender, the discipline of prayer, the discipline of humility, the discipline of self-control, the discipline of sacrifice. We're going to look at these disciplines over the next several weeks. If you're really committed, then you need to tell God today, I am committed. My goal is to be closer to you, and I'm committed. I'm committed to making that happen. Because here's the thing. If you want a truly intimate relationship with God, with your first love, then you're going to have to work at it. And I suggest today that we work at it together. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you and praise you that you love us with such depth that we can't even really comprehend it. And you desire this intimate relationship with us, this close relationship, this daily relationship, this growing relationship with us. And we allow sometimes the things of the world to get in the way. And, and, and in some instances, Lord, we've even allowed our love to fade a little bit. And we don't feel that same longing to be in your presence that we felt 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We pray, Lord, first of all, that you would forgive us that we've allowed that to happen in our lives. But we also pray, Lord, that your anointing would fall upon us and your spirit would dwell within us and you would lead and guide us back to, to our first love, the love we are called to have for you, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, as we go through this process. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.